and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. Historic preservation isn't anything new. Then again, preserving the past for future generations has a shorter history than many of us may know. As villages became cities and urban areas were developed into sprawling metropolises, history was often the first thing to be sacrificed. Often historic locations are more than spots on a map, they're hallowed ground. And once these sacred places are gone, they're gone. According to the American Battlefield Trust, only about 20 percent of the land upon which the Civil War was fought is permanently preserved. Today we'll learn about a current effort underway to preserve Vermont's Civil War history here at home and on the battlefields far from the Green Mountains. I'm joined by Vermont and Civil War historian Howard Coffin. He's the author of several books, including Something Abides, Discovering the Civil War in Today's Vermont, and Full Duty, Vermonters in the Civil War. And as our viewers know, Howard has been a fixture on Across the Fence longer than most of us can remember. As always, it's a pleasure to see you today. Great to see you, Judy. Before we talk about your recent efforts in battlefield preservations, how did you first get involved in this kind of work? Well, I grew up hearing stories from my mother <laughs> mm -hmm. about the Civil War because she remembered her grandfather who was in the Civil War. So it was in me, the Civil War was in me from before I really can, can remember, and that just evolved into an interest in reading about Civil War history. And as soon as I could get south and began to drive the battlefields, and it's always been there. So you've taken across the fence across Vermont and across the country to visit Civil War sites. What's it like to visit these battlefields? Well, the historian Jim McPherson, who's a dear friend of mine, once said that you cannot understand a Civil War battlefield unless you can walk it or bicycle it. That's the way Jim does it. Mm -hmm. And he's really right. You can't understand. You have to understand the terrain. You have to understand the uh, distance, which you can't experience unless you walk something. You really can't get, come to grips with a battle uh, unless you've been where it was fought. And to me, that's the most important reason for saving Civil War battlefields. Because all those things played into played into the, what they, happened. They all they all play into they all play into what happened. Absolutely. Now, what sort of memorable experiences have you had when you're walking these battlefields? Well, there are many. Some of them I would classify as mystical. One I particularly remember was the 125th anniversary of the Battle of Chancellorsville. It was the night of May 2nd, 1988, 125th anniversary, the night Stonewall Jackson was killed. Mm -hmm. And I had gotten special permission to go out on the battlefield at night because I knew the Rangers. I wanted to be there because there was a rare night battle at Chancellorsville. And I had read that the soldiers, uh, as they were fighting, suddenly the fighting stopped because a huge full moon rose in the east over the village of Fredericksburg. And as it came up, the whippoorwills began to sing. So here I was out in the woodland where this fighting had occurred, and it got dark and it was quiet. And then this incredible moon rose, and as it rose, the whippoorwills began to sing, and I remembered that the soldiers said it made them think of home. Well, you're currently involved in trying to preserve a section of the battlefield at Gettysburg, Camp Letterman. Tell us about that. After the Battle of Gettysburg, the village of Gettysburg, 2,500 people, was swamped with wounded. 20,000 sick, wounded Confederates and Union soldiers to take care of these soldiers of Vermonter, Henry Janes, a major, a surgeon, was sent to Gettysburg. And to deal with the most seriously wounded, he created a tent general hospital that he called Camp Letterman for one of his officers, uh, just east of the town of Gettysburg. And over the course of, well, it, the hospital lasted from July 22nd to November 20th. During that time, 4,000 soldiers were treated there. 365 of them died 
Incidentally, more Confederates died there than Union. Everybody got equal treatment. Mm -hmm. Jaynes did a magnificent job doing the best that he could to treat the most severely wounded. That site has been bought by a housing developer who owns 191 acres. The Gettysburg Battlefield Preservation Organization has asked for 17 acres of that land to be preserved, and that acreage is where the tent stood. Tell me about Dr. Henry James. Remarkable man. He's 32 when he gets the Gettysburg assignment. Before the war, he'd been the town physician in Waterbury. People loved him. After the war, he comes back to Waterbury and lives a long life well into the 1900s. And once again, he is uh, the town physician. But Jaynes had made an excellent reputation in the Union armies, particularly for being reluctant to amputate. Civil War bullets were soft lead things that just wrecked uh, limbs when they hit. And the standard operation just cut them off. But Jane said, no, let's save as many as we can. And he did save a remarkable amount of limbs. So how has the Vermont legislature helped in preserving efforts at Camp Letterman? You know, the legislature has been wonderful over the years when I've needed help in trying to save something. They were so important in keeping a Walmart store from being built on the wilderness battlefield, which Jim Jeffords had been so important in preserving. That looked like a lot of that was going to be destroyed. The res resolution from the legislature comes through and we stop Walmart. Well, when Gettysburg contacted me and said that this land where Camp Letter was going to stand, had stood, was going to be lost, hmm, what did I do? I went right to the legislature. And you know, this last session dragged on and on. Right. Thank God it did, gave me more time. But we got a resolution through, with, especially with the help of the Senate Institutions Committee. Mm -hmm. We got it through and sent it down to Gettysburg, they were extremely grateful, and now the Pennsylvania legislature has gotten into the act, and their House of Representatives has passed a similar resolution on a vote of 193 to nothing. <laughs> so How the, significant is that as far as it's well, showing? Well, we don't know yet, right? but uh, nothing's been built yet on that land. The developer hasn't handed over the land, but with pressure like this building, I think that we're going to win this one. How, why wasn't the land preserved before? You know, it's partly my fault. <laughs> I was on the Civil War Sites Advisory Commission mm -hmm. that studied all these battlefields, and at Gettysburg, we concentrated on the places where the fighting took place. Mm -hmm. There really wasn't any fighting where the hospital was. There was some artillery there, I suppose, troop maneuvers and so forth. We just frankly missed it and then it was open land but we we learned a lesson on the civil war sites advisory commission that always stood have, should have stayed with us and must stay with this nation any battlefield no matter how remote it is no matter where it is if it isn't permanently protected sooner or later will be lost and here's a classic example that this important hospital site is about to go, and it's taking desperate measures, but desperate times require desperate measures. In a perfect world, would you like to see maybe the, the hospital um, tent put back up, or a replica of it? Oh, absolutely, yes. What we hope will happen is that if we can stop the development and get this 17 acres, now uh, there would have to be an act of Congress to expand the Gettysburg National Battlefield before that acreage could be added to the Gettysburg National Park. But once the salvation takes place, that's pretty easy stuff. So make it part of the Gettysburg Park. So even though many battlefields at Gettysburg are preserved, talk about how there's sort of kind of islands surrounded by development. Yeah, it's been, I've been going to Gettysburg since 1967. So I've watched Gettysburg evolve and I've watched hotels and shopping centers, uh, for instance, there was one built on some land where the Vermont, some of the Vermonters camped the night before the battle. I don't like that. I think that Gettysburg is so important that there needed, of course, long ago to have been a land use plan drawn up uh, to protect this area. 
Gettysburg, you know, is rural country. Gettysburg surrounded by miles and miles of farmland. There's plenty of room that's not battlefield for hotels and stores and so forth. Uh, but yet, I've watched a lot of that battlefield uh, be eaten away. I've also watched some buildings get torn down that shouldn't be there. And so uh, the battlefield's gaining, too. Mm -hmm. So when will we know if Camp Letterman will be preserved, and who ultimately is going to be responsible for that land? Well, ultimately, we hope to put it in the responsibility of the National Park Service, and they do a wonderful job with the land that they hold. Uh, I'm waiting now on a daily basis. I know that I'll be among the first to hear uh, when there is a breakthrough on this thing. Nothing has occurred yet. Uh, I would expect that more states now will weigh in. Vermont's getting into the fight uh, was the first state uh, to oppose this development. And that's the kind of thing we need. We need heavy hitters. Where do you draw the line between historical preservation and development? Is there a middle ground? I'm not sure that there's a middle ground on battlefields. Core battlefields where the heavy fighting took place really needs to be kept as it originally was. It's very hard to interpret a battle when you're, when you're looking at a store. Then you have to try to tell somebody that, you know, just the, the, the soldiers walk through there. Right. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. You've got to try to keep things as they were. So one of the Union officers who turned the tide at Gettysburg was General George Stannard. Remind us about who he was. Well, he was a, a Vermonter, of course, from Georgia, Vermont. He led the Second Vermont Brigade at Gettysburg. He's our principal Civil War figure. And he orders the Second Vermont Brigade to make the flank attack on Pickett's Charge on the third day at Gettysburg, which I believe, and I wrote a book to prove it, won uh, the Battle of Gettysburg. Now, there is a house that Stannard owned up in Milton. There's a committee been formed, and they are saving that house. It's a house that Standard, we know he rented. He had a farm there. I think he lived there for a time. Mm -hmm. It's a very important historic site. It'll become a little education center and museum, and progress is being made again with the help of the legislature and some very hardworking local people. There are a lot of these sites like this sort of scattered around. How do people find out where to go and, and how to follow these trails? Well, it's going to become a lot easier. Uh, of course, you can always get my book, Something mm -hmm. Abides, which has about 1,500 Vermont sites. And, and there's some, some people, you town. told me, that people keep that book in their car. Yeah, a lot of them do, <laughs> yeah. yes. So when they're driving around, they can check right. their book. And, you know, it's been so long since I wrote it, I keep one in my car to remind <laughs> myself. But there is... Right now, a wonderful effort underway, um, the Vermont Civil War Heritage Trail, which will stretch from the border in Massachusetts all the way up to Canada along Route 7. And there's just Civil War site after Civil War site along the way, the St. Albans Raid mm -hmm. site. Of course, uh, Virgins, where John Brown's body came home after he was hanged at Harper's Ferry. John Brown's raid, of course, really started the Civil War. Uh, Rokeby, mm -hmm. uh, maybe the great Underground Railroad site in all America, is along that trail. Uh, one after another, the Rutland Fairgrounds, where the sharpshooter trials were held, the Lincoln home in Manchester, Lincoln's son. Uh, I mean, they're just lined up as if it was planned. So we're coming up on a one year since the white nationalist rally in Charlottesville, Virginia, which resulted in a riot and three deaths. Uh, white supremacist groups were there to protest the removal of a statue of Robert E. Lee. Um, as a historian, where do you stand on, on removing Confederate Civil War monuments? Well, first of all, the Civil War monuments on the battlefield are very helpful to someone like me who leads tours. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Lee statue at Gettysburg, the mounted Lee statue, stands on the spot where he directed Pickett's charge. Uh, he rode from that spot out to meet the, uh, uh, the battered soldiers uh, coming back. Uh, the Longstreet statue is, is in the approximate place where he was during Pickett's charge. I mean, a lot of these statues are very helpful mm -hmm. on the battlefields. Right. 
uh, but in the South, where these Confederate monuments are everywhere, they're very offensive to black people because they honor the Confederate cause, which essentially was operating to keep slavery in existence in this country where it's supposed to have been illegal. Aren't all men created equal in the Declaration of Independence? So you're going to see a lot of these monuments, Confederate monuments, off the battlefields in the South come down, and that's all right with me. Black people have suffered enough in this country. Howard, I want to thank you for joining me today. That's our program for today. I'm Judy Simpson. I'll see you again next time on Across the Fence.